Here's the question. Can you outpace light? The answer might seem like a no. Light's the fastest thing, so you can't outpace light in a race, right? Well, it turns out if you have a good enough of a, of a head start, you can outpace light forever without going faster than. So how is that possible? Allow, allow me to explain. So let's just say that light moves at 10 meters per second. Or if, if you don't like that, we can define units in which the speed of light is 10. I'm choosing 10 because 10 is an easy number to work with. So that means that the position of light as a function of time is going to be x of t equals 10 t. And let's say, let's say that light starts at the origin. So this is the position of light as a function of time. But let's say that your position as a, as a, as a function of time is going to be 5t plus, say, 15 or 20. So this means that you're 20 meters ahead of light and your speed is 5 meters per second. And the light speed is 10 meters per second. So you have a good enough of a head start. So when will light actually catch up to you? Because since light is moving faster than you, light will eventually catch up to you if you have a constant velocity. So when does that happen? So that happens when XL equals XY. So that happens when 10T equals 5T plus 20. And then that means that 5T equals 20. So T equals four seconds light will catch up to you. So after four seconds, light will approach you and you lose the race. Now, what if your position as a, as a function of time was instead, say, 6t plus 20? So you have the same head start, but you're moving just a little bit faster. Now, this means that light will catch up to you when xl equals your new position as a function of time. So it's going, it's going to catch up to you when 10t equals 6t plus 20. So that means that 4t equals 20. So t equals five seconds. That's when light will actually catch up to you and you lose the race. Okay, well, what if you move at say eight meters per second? So that means that light catches up with you when 10t equals 8t plus 20, that gives us 2t equals 20t equals 10 seconds. You see that the faster we move, light takes a longer time to catch up to us. That seems obvious, yeah, but what are the implications of this? Well, let's say that we're in a race, okay, this is you. This is you. And this is red guy. And then this is yellow guy. And we're all trying to outpace light. Now you're traveling at say, what was it? Originally you're traveling at five meters per second. The red guy is traveling at six meters per second. And yellow guy is traveling at eight meters per second. And then you all have a head start. Well, you, we, all the people start at uh, the x equals 20 meter line. And we give, light gives us a head start. So here's like a photon. Here's light. And it's light starts at the zero meter mark. You guys start together at the 20 meter mark. And light is traveling at 10 meters per second. So after, what was it? After four seconds, light catches up to you. After five seconds, light catches up to your friend red. And after a whopping 10 seconds, light catches up to yellow. So light beats all of you guys. But what if one light is about to hit you at like a 3.99 second mark, light's about to hit you, you instead accelerate to be traveling at 60 meters per second instantaneously. So like, well, so like your instant, instantaneous velocity is six meters per second. So you accelerate to 60 meters per second. 
And Light's about to hit you, you accelerate to the red guy now. And Light won't hit you at the four second mark, since for the red guy, Light will hit you at, at the five second mark. Oh, well, then that means that one second later, Light's going to hit you, since you're the red guy now. But let's say that the that now you do the same trick as before, and you accelerate to 18 meters per second right before the light is about to hit you. Well, then that means that at 10 seconds, the light will still hit you again, right? Okay, well, let's say that you accelerate again to say 9 meters per second. The light will hit you at some later time, like 11.2 seconds, say. Well, then right before light hits you, accelerate again to say 9.3 meter per second and then 9.7 meters per second and then 9.999 meters per second you guys probably see where i'm going with this as long as you accelerate to the next guy in the race velocity right before light hits you light will never actually hit you so you can outpace light as long as you keep accelerating even when your instantaneous velocity is smaller than 10 meters per second so you can win a race with light as long as you have a good enough head start now what are the implications of this well this effect happens in classical mechanics right and nothing really fancy happens in classical mechanics but, but when we switch this to, to special relativity something really cool actually happens as long as we keep accelerating, right, we can outpace light. Now, if we can outpace some photons, if we're accelerating, and, and light is the fastest thing in relativity, or in special relativity, that means that some events far away enough can't actually reach us. So let's make this a bit more precise. So say here, here you are. Again, you are trying to outpace light and you are accelerating. You will actually be able to outpace a photon right over here. As long as, long as you keep accelerating. Again, you don't, you don't have to accelerate faster than light. You, like your, your velocity will, will always be smaller than light. But as long as, as you accelerate in smaller and smaller increments, as you as in top the approach the speed of light, you can still outpace light. So this means that this photon over here won't actually catch up to you. As long as you just, as long as you just accelerate just a little bit more each second. And this means that some events won't catch up to you. It means that some things that happen, say that someone like sneezes, right? Someone sneezes, their sneeze won't catch up to you. Or say that a star explodes, the explosion won't catch up to you. Say that, like, there's, like, a gravitational wave. That wave won't catch up to you because you're accelerating just a little bit extra. And that's a horizon. There is a horizon behind you where events that take place won't be able to influence you. So since you're outpacing light, you're sort of like you're outpacing events in the past. And that's a horizon. It's like a black hole kind of, because for black holes, things past the event's horizon won't ever catch up to you from the perspective of like an, a, an infalling observer. So we have a horizon in special relativity but not a black hole event horizon. It's a horizon that an accelerating observer kind of creates by having this sort of idiosyncratic, just slightly a bit more acceleration. And we know that in general relativity, a black hole horizon actually ends up creating particles called Hawking radiation. And this means analogously, this horizon that the accelerating observer kind of sees, or more accurately does not see, will also create particles as well. And this is called unruh radiation. And that's going to be the topic of today's video. How do we actually derive this thing? Well, let's get into it.
So here we have a space-time diagram that, that, that depicts what, what we were just talking about earlier. So the orange line represents the, the world line for light, a photon, where x equals t is the path of the photon. And then this red curve over here, that's the path of the accelerating person that's just accelerating in such a way where they outpace light. And we can see how this actually works here. Like a light beam that's right over here will catch up to the accelerating observer. So will a light beam right over here. But this, but this light beam right over here will asymptotically approach the red guy, but will never actually touch it. And the actual path that this guy creates in space-time, this is called a hyperbola. And likewise, the light beams behind the hyperbola Again, they won't catch up to the red guy either. But note that when the red guy immediately starts moving at a constant velocity, say like right over here, then light will catch up to it. Even if it still accelerates in a normal way, like say this, it will also hit the light. So it has to have a special kind of acceleration. So, What's the actual path of this hyperbola? Well, we already know what functions create hyperbolas. Those are the hyperbolic trig functions. And a special aspect of these functions in space-time is that paths with a hyperbolic paths have what's called a constant proper acceleration. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, we know that in relativity, there's a constant called the four velocity. The four velocity is just the tangent vectors along some world line. So I can have this world line right over here. I know this world line is not physical, but we can have some world line parameterized by lambda. So we'd have x lambda and then t lambda describing this path from the perspective of an inertial observer. And we can have tangent vectors along the path and these tangent vectors they're called the four velocity now we typically choose lambda to be the proper time of the actual path and this is like this is because like, like the proper time is going to be the time observed by the actual path we're describing so we would just choose the lambda to be proper time tau. So in this case, this over here is going to be the four velocity. And it's called four velocity because like, you know, there's four components to it because we have four dimensional space time. But for our case today, we are going to be working with two dimensional space time because it's easier. But in general, it's just two, four dimensions. So the four velocity is, yeah, we can actually expand the four velocity out in terms of components. We can expand it out as d dt over d tau, partial r over partial t, plus dx over d tau, partial r over partial x. We are just using the multivariable chain rule here. It might be confusing because we have t and tau. Again, tau here is just a path that parameterizes the, the uh, world line that we choose to, to describe, where t here is the actual time coordinate for the inertial observer's guy's uh, thing. So yeah, that's that. And here we have the basis vectors of space-time over here. These are the basis vectors that we use to build vectors in space-time. Now, an important aspect of the four velocity is um, we can, we can take the derivative of it again to get what's called the four acceleration. So to do that, we just take d over d tau of dt over d tau partial r over partial t. And by the way, I cover the multivariable chain rule a lot more in my tensor calculus series. So check that out if you guys are a bit rusty on the chain rule, multivariable chain rule. So our basis vectors in Minkowski space-time, I should specify here, it's probably obvious already, but we are using Minkowski space-time right now. 
So the basis vectors of, of Minkowski space-time don't change at all. Or in other words, the Christoffel symbols are all zero. So this means that we, we have the second derivative of t over tau, partial r over partial t, plus second derivative of x with, with respect to the proper time, partial r over partial x. And that's going to be our four acceleration. We can actually store this into a matrix that looks like this over here. Oops, this should be that. And then here we have the basis that we are working with. So what's really important about the four acceleration is that we can take the dot of product of the four acceleration with itself. And that's just going to be, um, well, you guys can already pretty much deduce what it's going to be. It's going to be this squared minus this squared. And the reason is that we're just we're taking the inner product of this vector with itself. So, we, so like we, we know you know how, how vectors work. If a b times a b, that's just a squared plus b squared. But that's using the Euclidean metric. So. And for the Minkowski metric, we're, we're going to have a minus sign here. And by the way, we are working with the, uh, what I call I call it the based me me metric. It's the mostly minus sign convention. A lot of general relativity books use the mostly plus convention. I disagree with that convention because I think it's uh, stupid. I I I'm more of a particle physics kind of guy. So I like choosing the mostly minus sign convention. So that's, that's why we have this over here. But in your book, you're probably going to see it re written like this but this channel is called fermion physics and fermions are particles so it, it would make more sense to stick with the particle physics convention of this real plus so this is the, going to be the mostly plus convention but we are going to use the mostly minus convention so we now have that over there over, over here and this is going now if, well, how do I say this? We can define this thing to be equal to some number called a, a squared, where a is called the proper acceleration. So the proper acceleration is just going to be the length of the four acceleration. So it's pretty simple, it's just how big the four acceleration is. What I, I want to make clear is that the proper acceleration is, is not the same thing as acceleration. Like, it, it, there is a there, there there can be some potential p potential like confusion with proper variables versus the variables themselves. Acceleration is just the rate of change of the velocity. Proper acceleration is rate of change of the four velocity. Now we well now hi hyperbolic um world lines like the world line over here that was a weird area this one over here this one is going to have a what's called a constant proper acceleration meaning that that, that the a in this case the a is going to be constant but for any other kind of world line a will not be constant and it will depend on tau now or x and t but in this case, for hyperbolic functions, oops, hyperbolic functions, they will have a constant proper acceleration. Now, how do we actually prove this? Well, the, this path over here, it's, it's a hyperbola, right? So it can actually be modeled by t of tau equals one over a cinch a tau and x tau equals one over a cos hyperbolic cosine a tau. So what we're doing here is we're, we're just saying that we can describe this hyperbola as this right over here. And we see it, it kind of makes sense since we are using hyper hyperbolic sine and, hyper and hyperbolic cos cosine. So we can actually, well, well what, what we need to do now is we need to verify that this path over here has a constant proper acceleration. If it does, then it 
then that means that this path does have the constant proper acceleration. If it is not, well, then it means that, that the converse is true. So how do we do that? Well, we need to see if this holds over here. So to do that, we have to first calculate the derivative of the time with respect to the proper time. That's just going to be 1 over a, or actually it's going to be just hyperbolic cosine of a tau. a here, by the way, is going to be the proper acceleration. So we, we got this because the derivative of hyperbolic sine is a hyperbolic sine of a t, but then, that, but then the a over a is just 1, so we just have this. And then dx over tau, that's going to be uh, cinch of a tau. I guess might be wondering, whoa, shouldn't it be a minus cinch? Well, the really cool thing about hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine is the hyperbolic sine is defined as e to the x minus e to the minus x. That's in contrast with sine of x being equal to 1 over 2i times e to the ix minus e to the minus ix. So what's really cool is that the, der the derivative of hyperbolic sine, well, I should first of all say what hyperbolic cos cosine is. Hyperbolic cosine is e to the x plus e to the minus x. So we can see, see that the derivative of hyperbolic sine is hyperbolic cosine. And the derivative of, of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine, since that's just going to be e to the x minus e to the minus x. So there won't be a negative sign in front of this. So now what we, what we have to do is have to take the, take the derivative of that again. That's just going to give us a cinch a tau, or t at tau. And then for this guy over here, it's going to be a cos, or how about a cosine of a tau. So that means, so now what we want to do is we, we, we want to find out what this minus this is going to be. Well, that's just going to be equal to a squared cinch squared a tau minus a squared co, uh, hyperbolic cosine we can factor out the a squared, and we have cinch over hyperbolic cosine, and that's just going to be one, it's a trig identity, so we have a squared. And that's exactly what this was. So, I mean, so this shows for, for sure that it does give us a constant proper acceleration, because here a was defined to be some constant number, I mean, here, it's kind of a piece of, a piece of notation, but here a doesn't have to be constant, but here a is constant, and since a is constant here, that means that this a is constant, meaning that this does have a constant proper acceleration. So this means that we can use um, where these coordinates over here to describe how the accelerating object moves in the inertial observer's reference frame. That was a lot to review, um, so let's uh, move into the next topic. So again, here we have our equations that parameterize the hyperbolic path in spacetime. So now what, we're, what we want to do is we want to look at the quantum field from the perspective of the accelerating observer. So to do that, we have to first look at what the perspective of the, of the accelerating observer actually is. And here is the future horizon, future event horizon. And then here you have the past event horizon. So what coordinates should we use to actually describe the accelerating observer? Well, we can't use coordinates that extend throughout our Minkowski space-time, since like the future events, like the events past our horizon, the present horizon, don't influence the accelerating observer. So he shouldn't be able to actually describe those events. So the coordinates of the accelerating observer, called the Rindler coordinates, should only exist in this region right over here, 
this render wedge. So to actually describe this guy's coordinates, what we can do is just like shift the acceleration. So if you just shift, like if you look at, like a, at a whole class of hyperbolic accelerating functions, and we just graph all of those, we get something like this. And then what we can do is, well, first of all, let, let's call these like hyperbolic lines. Let's call that N. And then we can have outgoing radiating lines, blue lines, that look like this. So this kind of like ray outwards. And let's call the lines of a constant blue, let's, let's call that epsilon. And these are actually our coordinates, like we're done. These coordinates will describe an accelerating observer's perspective. Now, how does it actually do this? Well, n here is going to be the time that the accelerating observer measures, whereas epsilon is going to be as the space, like the, like the space coordinate for the accelerating observer. Now, does this actually make sense? Well, think about it. Here, the red line, let's actually highlight the red line in red. So here we had the red line. In the new coordinates, right, the red line is actually staying at a constant position over time because time is increasing, right? So let's say that here is, so here's so we have one, two, three, four. Here we have epsilon is four and then N is zero. So we have zero, four. And then here we'd have one, four. And then here we'd have two, four and so on so basically it's staying at the same position in the in the new coordinate position over the new coordinate time so the hyper hyperbola has a has a velocity of zero in that frame of reference in the new coordinates and epsilon so these coordinates here do actually describe the perspective of the accelerating frame now, a cool aspect of this new coordinate system is that, is that the speed of light isn't actually constant. If we were to actually graph a light, the, the path of light, right, it's going to look something like this. We see here, if we were to zoom in a bit, that this light over here, like, like it's actually passing through like a half of a unit of space in one unit of time meaning that it's going slower than light. Let me, let me try to, to re rephrase that. Light over here, like one unit corresponds to like a light meter, like one unit of space, one unit of space corresponds to a light second, one unit of time corresponds to one light meter. So if some path goes one like X unit, and one time unit, that means that it has a speed of C. It, it's going at, at the speed of light. But if it's going, but if it's time-like, so it's going through a, sm a smaller amount of the spatial distance, given the same time, it's going slower than light. So this light being over here, that's parallel to this light being over here, it's going through a smaller amount of the uh, X unit, given some constant time unit. So this light beam is moving less than C. So the light is moving less than the speed of light in a way. But then over here, if you have this another light beam, that's going like, say this, this light beam is going to go through one unit of the X direction and one unit of the time direction. So this is going at the speed of light. But if you move past the hyperbolic person, so let's use a different color. Let's use, uh, let's use brown. So this guy over here is moving through an even larger amount of space given some constant time because the boxes are kind of getting slanted 
in this direction over here. So it, it might seem kind of weird, uh, kind of because because of all the lines, it, it can make the it's a lot of like information going on here. But the basic idea is that due to the weird coordinate system this person is using, light beams that are in front of the red hyperbolic path move faster than C, and light beams behind it move slower than C. So an accelerating observer will actually see light ahead of it moving faster than C, and light be behind it moving very slowly. In fact, it actually sees light moving like at the actual horizon to have a velocity of zero. That's the, so that's the reason why things behind the horizon cannot catch up to the accelerating observer from the accelerating observer's perspective. The accelerating observer doesn't see himself as accelerating, right? He sees himself as stationary. However, he will say that he's outpacing light, not because of his weird acceleration, but because of the, that speed of light is just slower behind him. So that's going to be his reason. And it's kind of like how near a black hole, the speed of light will decrease and then stop. So having that terminology cleared, we can actually now do some quantum field theory. All we've done so far was a review of special relativity. Now it's time to make some things quantum. Also, um, I should probably mention this, the coordinates of the Rindler observer, that's what the observer of the hyperbolic function is called. The Rindler observer, the accelerating, proper accelerating observer, their coordinates can be, well, the X and T coordinates can be expressed in terms of N epsilon, where T is going to be one over A, E to the A epsilon, and then hyperbolic sine, A N, and then x equals 1 over a e to the a epsilon hyperbolic cosine a n. So here we have the Klein-Gordon equation for a inertial Minkowski observer in flat space-time. And we know this because we use the Minkowski metric over here. Now we can also rewrite it as this over here if we were to expand out the Minkowski metric. So to, to describe the Rindler observers, the quantum field for the Rindler observer, we would have to use the Rindler metric instead of the Minkowski metric. Now, how do we actually obtain the Rindler, the Rindler metric? Well, we can actually write out the Rindler metric in terms of the Minkowski metric like this over here. And if you guys wanna see a derivation for this, watch my metric tensor transformation video in my tensor calculus series. So it's going to be a sum over mu and nu. Mm -hmm. So to find the g not not component of the Rindler metric, that's just going to be partial c mu over partial p not partial c nu over partial p not n mu nu. And then we can expand this out. And then here, the general coordinate c is going to take on values of t and x. So t is c naught, and then x is c1. And then p, that's going to be n and epsilon. So p naught is n, and then p1 is epsilon. So this is going to give us partial t over partial n. And then we know that this is, just, this is just going to be partial t over partial n squared minus partial x over partial n squared. And we actually have our formula for x and t, at t or t is going to be one over a e to the a epsilon cinch n, and then x is going to be one over a e to the a epsilon hero cosine a n. So we wanna calculate what partial t over partial n is going to be and partial t over partial epsilon, and also partial x over partial n, and partial x over partial epsilon. So let's start out with partial t over partial n. That's going to give us, and then partial t over partial epsilon is going to give us e to the a 
epsilon a n and this should be a cosine actually hyperbolic cosine so then partial x over partial n that's going to give us and then partial x over partial epsilon that's going to give us e to the a epsilon hyperbolic cosine so this, is, so this is the all the info we need to use the rest of the video. So what now? Well, we have this minus this for the g not null component of the metric tensor. So that means that g not null. Let's actually just copy this and paste it. So g not null is going to be e to the 2a epsilon cosine squared a n and then minus e to the 2 a epsilon sine squared we can factor out the exponential we have hyperbolic cosine squared of a n minus hyperbolic sine squared of a n and the cool property is that this is going to be equal to one so we are going to have e to the 2 a epsilon the first entry of the metric tensor. G11 is going to be minus e to the 2a epsilon. Now what about the G10, which is going to be equal to G01? Well, that's just going to be as partial c0 over partial p1, partial c0 over partial p0 and not not plus partial c1, or yeah, partial c1 over partial P1 partial C1 over partial P0 and 1, 1. And then we can, we can also do 1 and not, but N1 and not is going to be 0. So these are the terms that we need that we need to actually evaluate. Now this is going to be equal to partial, and this is equal to this over here. So these terms will just go to 0. And this means that this component is going to be equal to zero. So this means that G mu nu is going to have components of e to two a epsilon zero zero minus e to two a epsilon. Since the Klein Gordon equation is partial a partial b g a b plus m squared v equals zero, this is going to just be zero. So it's going to be equal to e to two a epsilon partial t squared, a really partial um n square in this case minus partial epsilon plus m squared phi equals zero so let's write this out in a bit more cleaner fashion we can distribute the phi to give us now this looks pretty close to the klein gordon for the inertial observer except for the fact that this e to the 2 a epsilon is, is not scaling the m squared. If m was equal to zero, we would just have e to the 2 a epsilon times this over here equals zero, meaning that we, we could just let this over here be zero. And then we'd have our normal mode expansion. It, it looks exactly like, like the Klein Gordon equation for a massless scalar field, right? But in this case, for, for when the mass is not zero, we don't get normal Klein-Gordon equation because like, we can't really set any term here to be zero. But we, what we do have is this over here equals minus m squared phi. So unless if we were to have this to be like one, there would be no problem. And this would just be a homogeneous differential equation, but since that's not the case, we can't really solve this, e this equal equation very easily. We can still solve it using Bessel functions, and that would be a story for uh, a mathematician to solve, but since we want to deal with elementary functions, we are going to work with the case where m equals zero. So to, to derive the Unruh effect, we will be working with a massless scalar, scalar field. Have a massless scalar field, we would just have what looks like the regular Klein-Gordon equation. 
And then again, we can just expand this out, this phi, to solve it, we're going to have a v of epsilon or n epsilon. That's going to be the integral. So here, see free scalar field expansion. If you chose to use a two-dimensional space-time, this would just be p over here, and this would just be 2 pi over here. We can see that we're using p for the momentum instead of k, because for different observers, they will see a different momentum. So we have to use p and not k. And also, this should be not an x mu. Let, let, let's use x tilde mu instead where x tilde not equals um, n, and then x tilde 1 equals epsilon. So this looks very similar to the free scalar field expansion. In fact, it's, it's actually exactly the same thing as the expansion for the constant speed observer. We'd have a of k e to the minus i k mu x mu plus a conjugate k e to the i k mu x mu. And the question here is, like, like if we declare that the field is the same, the two observers agree on the actual field, so if phi of t x does equal phi of n epsilon, if we take that a priori, that would imply that we can write out our coefficients in terms of a of k and a conjugate k. And if it turns out that these are not exactly the same, in other words, if a of k is not equal to b of p, that would imply that these operators over here will create and destroy a different number of particles than the inertial operators meaning that the two observers will disagree on the number of particles in some general quantum state. And this will lead us to the unruh effect. Now, we will be delving more into this in the next video, where we will be using the bogle ball transformation to actually derive this for the unruh effect. Um, and yeah, so we're going to leave it off here. See you guys then. Bye.